All right, folks, welcome back. Welcome back from our break. Uh, we'll resume uh, today's event with a discussion um, on small business. Um, we are joined by um, really cutting edge thinkers on this subject. Um, um, and uh, the panel will be uh, moderated by the wonderful Renee Merle. They will be trying to tackle the following question. Small businesses around the United States have been decimated by COVID-19. What is the best way to preserve and revive American small businesses during the recovery of this crisis and beyond? Um, I so look forward to this conversation. Uh, Renee, please take it away. Yes, thank you guys so much. I, um, one second is my video. There's my video, thank you. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us. I, I really think that we're gonna be tackling here what I think is one of the most important um, issues that have come up during this um, crisis, and that's going to be an important facet of our economic recovery. Um, you know, the last panel talked about this some um, as well. Um, you know, small businesses account for 44% of the U.S. economy, uh, economic activity. More than 100,000 small businesses have already closed permanently um, since the pandemic escalated in March. And, um, you know, we're entering what could be another tough period, especially for restaurants, for example, you know, as we go from being able to dine outside to being pushed inside because of the weather. So I actually want to start with Adam. You're not only a labor economist, but you're a small business owner. You own a restaurant bowling alley, alley video arcade called Decades. Um, first of all, please just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, what has made the biggest difference from your, for your small business since um, the crisis started. What has, you know, really helped you guys survive so far? Sure. So um, my day job is I'm the chief economist at Upwork, which is the world's largest on-demand talent platform. It's a, a website where you can uh, find freelancers all over the world. And uh, in addition to that, like you mentioned, I'm one of the owners of Decades, which is bowling, arcade, um, and restaurant and bar. Uh, it's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And um, you know the, the aid from the government so far has helped for sure. We qualified for a PPP loan and that helped. It could have helped more had it come with less strings attached for sure. I mean, the, it was an attempt to really um, try to at the same time save uh, millions of small businesses and also try to force them to keep uh, as many people as possible on payroll. And, you know, for, for businesses who are going to keep all their workers on payroll, that's not a big deal that they, you know, they've been helped by this tremendously. But for businesses who didn't know what the long run was going to look for them, this really forced them to spend more money on that than they otherwise would have. So it was less help for them. And that's especially true for us as well. And, you know, at this point, those businesses have right-sized to the current economic environment. PPP has gone. Uh, if they were holding more workers than they need to survive at this point, then those workers are on unemployment. So you have to ask yourself, what did we really accomplish by tying businesses' hands and forcing them to keep those workers on? It would have been better to just give, um, you know, less restricted relief and you know that's my perspective as someone who got ppp and my perspective as an, an economist who thought a lot about how to help small businesses from so with your um restaurant bar bowling alley in specific you know are you able to keep all of your employees or are you planning to have to are you going to have to furlough some of them at some point coming up uh, so we've we've already scaled down significantly. I mean, we only have on as many people as we need, and revenues are twenty eight percent of normal. So mm. that's and that's an improvement from where it was. So we have who we need, but we just can't afford to have costs any higher than they are. We're trying to survive. We're losing money every single month. We are at the point now where we ran out of PPP. We ran out of the cash that we had saved in the business. Um, which was substantial coming into this. We didn't take any profit in our, in our prior year. We put that aside to pay off short-term debt and to hold a cash reserve because we saw the pandemic threat coming in January. And that's gone. PPP's gone. We got a, a grant from the county. That's gone. And now we're putting money into the business. So we really can't afford to have costs be any higher than they need to be um, or else, you know, the business is at risk. One of the complexities of PPP has been the forgiveness program portion of that. It's supposed to be a forgivable loan. Have you guys started that process yet? 
We haven't, but we're going to start it really soon. They, my partners and I have been emailing back and forth, talking to our accountants, and that's the reality. You you need to help your accountants on this. I mean, I'm a PhD economist who designed and proposed my own recovery plan. And I've been talked with legislators early on about um, and advised about the design of this, the PPP policy. So I've been following along very carefully. And even I can't do the paperwork without the help of an accountant. So I think that really tells you something about the excessive complexity here. Now imagine someone who doesn't have Mm -hmm. PhD in economics and can't afford an accountant right now. You know, they're really in a tough spot trying to figure out how to get forgiveness, trying to figure out how to make the most of the PPP loan. So do you keep all your people on? Do you let people off? How do you try to maximize the value of it to improve the odds of your business surviving? It's really complicated. And especially in, you know, amidst all these changes in the rules as PPP went along. So, you know, I just, you know, I feel tremendously bad for, you know, businesses who had even fewer resources and even less information about this. Amanda, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, there's the current discussion, a lot of debate going on about whether there should be a PPP2, uh, you know, whether there should be more funding for the program put in, or, and if there is, what should be done differently? From your perspective, if you could make some changes to the to PPP, if there is more funding in the next stimulus bill, what would you like to see changed about it? Yeah, well, I think first, unfortunately, um, we saw a race to get PPP when the first tranche of funding was unlocked ba uh, back in April. It was exhausted in two weeks. Um, and unfortunately, I think uh, the early decisions in allocation of PPP and in particular mediating it through financial institutions had a large impact on who received funding and didn't. Um, we know from data that 11% of small businesses were closed already even before the mandatory lockdowns came down. And then, um, and then that grew as the lockdowns spread across the country. And a lot of small businesses extinguished their cash on hand, um, maybe even before the PPP was available. So I think it's really concerning um, that a significant amount of damage could have been done even before the PPP was available. That being said, there's still around $130 billion that Congress provided um, and the deadline for applications uh, expired and Congress didn't renew it. So I think unlocking that money, um, even notwithstanding the fact that uh, I think a lot of small businesses missed out early on, um, but that would, be a, that would be a wise idea. And to get to Adam's point, I think that um, similar to the 2008 financial crisis and some of the home ownership uh, preservation programs, Congress is very concerned with headline risk. They're very concerned with um, unworthy businesses getting the money um, it, with the perception that the funds are being wasted. So I do think that some of uh, the conditionality that Adam mentioned um, would best be relaxed. I think policymakers um, underestimated how bad the public health response would be, underestimated how much businesses would have to invest in social distancing, um, and hygiene measures uh, and, and some of the conditionality around giving money to workers, um, I think held businesses back. And the final point is I think any rethinking of the PPP really needs to be accompanied with how we rethink our unemployment insurance program mm -hmm. and um, not, su not sufficient work was done to make sure that those two things interlock. Um, and, and moving forward, it would be good to, to look at how these two programs could work together. Satyam, can you um, introduce yourself as well? And I'm actually interested in hearing from you about um, whether having the banks act as intermediary on PPP was a, a part of the problem. And if, you know, if so, how else would we get the money to companies? What's the better way to get money to, P to companies? Uh, hi, my name is uh, Satyam Khanna. I am a fellow here at NYU and prior to this worked in the SEC and the Treasury. So it, it's great to be here um, and hear Adam, especially your stories, um, which sort of give life to the things that, that we have been thinking about in the, in the policy space for a while. So you asked Renee, um, I think the, the most salient question is what's the best way mm -hmm. to get money to businesses or to have gotten money to businesses. And I, there's a point that Antonio Weiss raised on the last panel, which he talked about the rise in non-financial debt. Um, in the economy on the eve of the crisis. And, and there's, a, there's actually a good example here in New York that I wanted to introduce. Um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, New York 
uh, open restaurants at 25% capacity. And, and that's a big development and it's testament to the fact that New York has less COVID uh, than, than other parts of the country that are more restricted. And, and that's a big deal, but I'm, I'm worried personally uh, because those restaurants, even at 25% opening, are gonna be operating under the same level of fixed cost unless they have an agreement with their creditors um, as they were pre-pandemic. And the math just won't add up. And, and so I think the first thing that we should have done and grappled with, and I don't think we have done enough yet, I think states have begun to tackle this, but, but not at the federal level, um, is this issue of debt overhang of small businesses. And it gets to your question of how what's the best way to get money to businesses the fastest and the most uniform way um, in terms of how it was channeled through the banks versus otherwise. And so um, if businesses are operating with a, with a debt overhang, um, that just means that when they get PPP money, when they, if they finally make it to their bank and get that money, they're going to use it to pay off their higher cost debts as opposed to investing in the workers, investing in the businesses and growing and trying to stimulate the demand in the economy. Or if we're at the point where Adam is and he's concerned as to whether he gets forgiveness, um, in addition to introducing a lot of uncertainty into his business, the PPP could make the problem worse because PPP is loan based. Um, as opposed to a grant or something like that, uh, the debt overhang problem. So I just don't think that's what Congress was envisioning mm -hmm. when it enacted the PPP. And so at the time, uh, I, in, in the New York Times with Adam Levinson, who's a professor at Georgetown, uh, advocated for a pause in small business debt collections. And that's things like bank loans, credit card debts, utilities. Um, it's not a crazy concept. We did this in the CARES Act for residential mortgages, where you could seek forbearance from uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, FHA insured loans. Um, and, and it was not so much of a strange concept that we did the same thing in 2008 when we bailed out large financial institutions. And we didn't do that through debt. We did it through equity, precisely because we were worried at the time of introducing debt onto already levered vulnerable institutions. So I think that would have been a better and cleaner way, more uniform way to um, get cash to businesses faster. Um, so so and that's, and, and, and I'm, what I'm concerned with now is that businesses are operating with substantial debt overhang to the point where that might depress the recovery even further. So I, I think dealing with debt overhang should be first and foremost in our minds at the time, but also should continue to especially be the case now when um, we're entering a period of even more uncertainty in the winter with how people, when people are inside, outdoor, outdoor dining is going to be less, uh, and there's just far more uncertainty with um, the pace of the recovery now that all the uh, benefits have expired. So um, that, I think that's the main thing uh, in terms of how we should have gotten money faster. And that's not to say the PPP was a waste. And Adam, Adam, Adam is testament to the fact that it kept the lights on for some time. Um, but I think that would have been a cleaner way to do it. And in, in, in the context of the PPP, um, there's ways it could have been structured much better, which we can get into, um, to encompass some of those fixed costs that it didn't currently do. To, to quote you to you, I read that New York Times column and you wrote, uh, without this relief though, meaning um, cancellation of debt or you know, suspension of debt payments, you said without this relief though, we risk a cascade of small business defaults, sending a shock wave through the markets and the economy. And if small businesses go under today, they would not be able to provide jobs and services when the quarantine ends. So my question is, and I think this is, comes up in like, came up in the last financial crisis and it's coming up now again with people who aren't able to pay their rent or pay their utilities. What happens when the suspension of debt payments ends? In your, in your mind, will these small businesses be forced to make a lump payment or will the payments be amortized over a certain time? I, I, what happens to those missed payments? You know, I think one thing uh, I, I have to admit um, is, is the op that op-ed and in general, this idea of forbearance. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to work for every business. And even businesses have a pause in payments. Not every business will survive. It depends on their business model. It depends if, you know, if you're a sole uh, accounting firm and you can telework, your employees can telework very easily. Um, maybe, maybe that means that you have a better chance of keeping the lights on. If you're only, all your employees are hourly workers, I think it could be different. So I, I'll be the first to admit that there's no magic bullet um, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of that, and so, but, but so to, to answer your question, I think there's a variety of ways it could have been done. Uh, when those, when the, you could do it amortized, you could tack on 
uh, three months or whatever the forbearance period is to the end of your mortgage, as, as I think they did in the CARES Act for the, yeah. the residential mortgage context. And, and, and I think I would just hesitate away from any one size fits all answer. There is one thing that in, in digging into this issue of the past six months is small businesses are the largest employers in the country, but they're also the most diverse. There are so many different types of small businesses. Um, and we don't even begin to, we, we have such poor data on them that it's hard to, uh, the government, it's hard for the government to um, understand that heterogeneity. Um, I, I hope the SBA does, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I hope somebody has visibility into the heterogeneity of small businesses so they can begin to answer the questions like you just posed, which is what is the right relief uh, to give them? Um, is it suspension? What happens when the suspension lifts? Is it amortization? Is it tacking on three months to payments at the back end? Um, is it compensating creditors and landlords on the front end like we advocated um, in that op-ed? There's a variety of ways you can do it. Adam, would that have helped you? So um, our, our bank actually worked with us to um, put three months uh, rent payment to the end of our loan and our landlord worked with us to mm -hmm. cut loan payments in half for a couple oh, wow. months. So we did get some help there. Um, so I, you know, it, it depends on the details sort of. I, I, I you know, I, I would be very concerned about asking banks at this point to take a hit at all on these loans because you have to worry about long run willingness to lend to small businesses. And if you're sort of jamming this down banks' throats, then this is gonna make you know, credit problems for small businesses in the future, uh, not great. And the, the approach I would take is, uh, I, I don't have any problem with that. I think, I think people who aren't business owners tend to think of more debt as per se worse than a grant. But if you extend a business, uh, a large um, flexible debt on something like a 30 year term with a 0% interest, you know, a lot of businesses would take that over a cash, uh, you know, a cash grant of some amount because that has tremendous value to them. It, make, it gives a big injection of cash. You make it flexible so that they can refinance their existing debt. So, you know, it's really, you shouldn't think of debt as being this like homogenous lump. It's like mm -hmm. oh, more debt bad, less debt good. It's not that simple. If you take debt and you refinance it, and you're able to stretch the payments out. If you say you have a five-year commercial loan, 7% interest, and you're able to pay that off with a 30-year loan, 0% interest, that improves the value of that business going forward. So not only does that help them make it through um, the period that we're in right now, but it gives them incentive to stick it out because the value of their business is, is gonna be helped um, you know, because they're gonna have lower operating expenditures going forward. So you give them a big flexible loan, you let them refinance existing debt, you let them purchase occupied real estate. So this is sort of a, a, a joint bailout landlord because when you're borrowing that cheap, that long-term, you can afford to overpay on the building a little bit and have your rent still go down massively, the cost of servicing the debt of that building. So I think if you give these big cheap loans, some, you know, the government can borrow for very long terms and you know very low rates right now. And I think we should pass that capability on to small businesses and let them do the same to refinance their existing debts, to purchase occupied real estate, and to do whatever it is they need to do with the money to adapt. Now that's debt, but when you give debt on those terms, that's extremely valuable debt. And I think something like that would be the most helpful businesses. Not only that, but it helps businesses who are willing to stick it out because it's sort of a long run thing versus if you say, I'm going to delay your debt payments for a month or a year, or you say, I'm going to give you a cash grant worth some dollars, every business is going to take that, whether they think they have a long run path to survival or not. Versus if you do this sort of loan, then only businesses who think they're going to be able to make use of it are going to take it because it doesn't reduce their actual amount that they owe. It just gives them more flexibility in paying it back and when. So I think it's a very good, you know, medium term, long term bridge versus a short term thing. It's just, you know, my concern is you don't want businesses to use this as sort of, I don't want to say a golden parachute because it's not a great landing, even if you're getting a um, PPP aid, but you don't want businesses to take it and then quit. You want them to yeah. take it and then stick it out for the sake of their employers, their creditors, their landlords, the community, for the economy as a whole. 
Amanda, can, can you talk a little bit about, I know you've done some research into how different countries have um, dealt with the same issue of what to do about um, helping their small businesses survive. How is what the U.S. is doing different? Are there any lessons we can learn from those, those other countries? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, the United States is unfortunately an outlier in our failed public health response, which really is the uh, original sim from which all these other problems flow. Um, so I think a much stronger public health response could have contained the fallout um, for small businesses better. But um, in terms of actual rescue programs, we're also an outlier there. Um, Pretty much every other country that has executed a small business uh, assistance program, uh, it was administered by either the state's taxing authority or like a business oversight authority with um, the capacity for businesses to apply directly to the government and be funded by the government uh, with those loans or abatements. Um, and you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about and talking to folks about is how do we build that infrastructure so that the next time this comes, we don't have to, um, have aid mediated through third parties. And I think maybe going through the banks was probably the best option available to policymakers when, when the crisis hit us, but it doesn't mean we can't build something better for the next time. Um, so, you know, whether that's working with payroll processing companies or the Fed, um, there's a number of diff different options where we could get that infrastructure in place. And I'll just say that when you mediate it through the financial sector, all of the problems in credit markets that existed before the pandemic get overlaid and even exacerbated during the crisis situation. So problems with um, you know, discriminatory access to credit, um, cherry picking the mm -hmm. largest or most favored clients. Um, and unfortunately we, we replicate that onto the new system. And uh, there's a lot of early evidence suggesting that that was the case in terms of um, who small businesses served by areas that uh, have a high penetration of mega banks, like the largest global banks, received fewer loans than small businesses located in areas that are served by more community lenders. So it's really a shame that the, the financial industry composition in an area um, was a determinant to whether or not a small business could get help. It was the problem that the, uh, the banks um, were just using their existing relationships. And so if you didn't have a relationship with them, obviously you had a harder time getting a loan or getting the PPP loan grant? Or was there something more systemic at play? Um, you know, I think the banks would tell, would tell me, I, because they have told me, that it was just first in, first out. Um, and they tried to make it as simple as that. Um, or do you, did you see something more systemic at play? Anybody? I will say I don't necessarily see malfeasance on the bank's part. I think that there was a lot of uncertainty. I scoured for SBA guidance to financial institutions to see what they were being told. It didn't really tell them how to queue up applications. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's one problem. We don't have data on who applied and didn't get funding. Um, so that's a big gap. But we do know that banks with more than $50 billion in assets had much larger loan sizes than, say, CDFIs or community banks. Um, and in fact, like double or triple the loan size for the big banks. So they tend to serve people that they're already serving um, in larger loan amounts rather than, you know, very small mom and pop businesses. Satya, did, did you have a thought on that as well? Um, no, just to, to sort of to echo the point about, about banks as sort of a, a bottleneck, I think it was, um, you know, short of, short of adopting my op-ed, I think when you're going, choosing to go through the system, you end up relying on banks to do the work of underwriting and fighting, finding, those, um, finding those people, finding those uh, uh, borrowers as, as banks typically do. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that in retrospect, um, we could just give them the, the program and say, you know, figure it out because what they're going to do is what they think is commercially rational. Um, and so we sort of imported a public purpose, which is a PPP, mm -hmm. onto the banking system. Um, and, and, and I think it was maybe the best we could have done at the time, um, but we didn't put rules uh, to sort of allocate that money. And there's a, been a, a number of proposals how that, those rules could have been structured. I think to Amanda's point, they just either weren't there or they were too confusing. Um, but one, one idea to think about is that there was this first mover advantage, whereas if you weren't uh, that was created because the pot of money, 360, I think it was. Yeah. I think it's going to be now we're maybe at six or 700 billion. Um, 
because the pot of money initially was smaller than what we eventually allocated, we just kind of went back to the well. Um, even though even conservative estimates, I think Glenn Hubbard had an estimate that it was a $1.5 trillion hole for three months of small business um, revenues. Uh, just because the pot of money was small, it created this first mover advantage. And because of that first mover advantage, these things followed where mm -hmm. the credit, the credit, uh, there was like a, a priority for a bank's existing credit relationship. So I think if that pot of money was bigger to begin with, and I understand politics is tough and negotiation and, you know, I, I, I don't sit in Congress, um, but uh, I think it would have mitigated some of, some of the problem you saw with how the credit was allocated and probably not all of it. We would have needed better rules, uh, but I think that would have helped. So, um, one of the things that we're seeing now that six months, more than six months into this crisis is that the, the crisis is um, impacting different groups um, differently. And um, this all, it's going to be like a lopsided um, recovery in a lot of ways. Um, there aren't a, a, a ton, there's not a ton of data out there, but it appears that um, minority owned and women owned small businesses um, have been more likely to fail. Um, and um, that uh, they're having, they had a harder time for whatever reasons that we've already discussed, perhaps getting PPP loans. And I wanted to see if you guys could talk to me about what the long-term impact of that is. If we're um, in this period where we're losing lots and lots of businesses, but it seems to be that they're also losing a lot of minority or women-owned businesses. If anybody has any thoughts on that. Sure, I could jump in there. Um, so I think that there's two things that small businesses do and they're kind of distinct and they're both really important. One kind of small business provides people with the kind of flexibility and lifestyle that they want to lead. Um, they don't want a nine to five job. They want to work for themselves. They want the freedom to work when they want. Um, they want to run things the way that they want to do. And it's really uh, a lifestyle. And that's extremely valuable to people. And for a lot of people, it's actually necessary for the way that they work. Um, you know, people with uh, disabilities, for example, are much more likely to be self-employed than, um, uh, than other people. And, uh, you know, you also see people who want flexibility in their day and their life, and that's really important to them. And you have to worry that now you're going to have this disproportionate impact um, based on that. So people are going to, they're not going to have access to working and living the kind of life they want to live. And they might be forced to go take nine to five employment, which is, it's still a job, but you know, that's not working and living the way they want to live. And for a lot of people, it's their dream. This is, you know, sometimes it's a multi-generational family thing. It has, it has ex extreme um, sort of value to people that goes beyond merely their paycheck. And it's really unfortunate to see that sort of um, affecting different communities and different groups more than others. I think that's, that's really problematic. The other thing which, um, is that business, small businesses provide is they are the next big businesses. Mm -hmm. And small businesses, they grow and they scale and they become you know, sources of dynamism and economic growth. And they're you know, the kind of entrepreneurship that is really important for the growth of this country. And to see um, you know, fewer African-American and women people at the top of organizations like that, because they got caught off early in their growth stage, that's, that's hugely problematic. I mean, we, we really need to see more representation in the top echelons of the business community. And to the extent that you're cutting these, you know, future big businesses of tomorrow off at the bottom, that's usually tragic. It's tragic for the economy. It's tragic for those individuals. And it's, you know, a tragic loss of an important uh, kind of representation in society. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. Uh, one, we, I got a question in from somebody in the audience about the comparing the Fed's Main Street Lending Program to PPP. Um, I've thought of the Main Street Lending Program as uh, for companies that are a little bit bigger than small businesses, but they're having the, it's having its own problems. I don't know if you guys see any lessons in that Main Street Lending Program for small businesses. Um, I've taken a look at that. You're, you're right. It, it's really struggling to get off the ground. I think, um, you know, with the Fed setting this up sort of ad hoc during the crisis, uh, I think we found uh, some of the Fed's norms and cultures running up against the congressional imperative they were given, which is the Fed does not want to take credit losses on its balance sheet. It is a 
It is a lender that provides liquidity for solvent firms that just need a little help getting through a crisis. Um, and it's a very mixed hybrid response with Congress appropriating money, but then the Fed leveraging its balance sheet. Um, so it's a very new program and it's just not within the institutional character of the Fed. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't learn and do better moving forward. Uh, Folks like Kate Judge at Columbia have offered up a lot of ideas about how the Fed could loosen some of the rules to make it a little the lending more attractive um, for these mid-sized firms to get access. But I also think, you know, culturally at the Fed, um, uh, to a certain extent, they view themselves as the stabilizer of, you know, equity and bond markets of the biggest companies. And they just have plumbing that works really well to accomplish that mission. And, you know, Jerome Powell at the end of March said, we're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to buy bonds. And the bond market stabilized. Spreads fell. Um, the stock market was was buoyed. So um, I think it's going to take some more thinking moving forward for the Fed or other institutions to be able to serve these, these businesses that don't have access to those capital markets. Is there... Um... What do you guys think? One of the ideas I've heard out there about how to help small businesses is, of course, taking a look at the tax code. Um, I, I don't know if that's something, you have, have any of you guys thought through that idea? Is there a way to change the tax code in some way that would have maybe even either long-term, short-term impact and help, but also maybe some long-term um, help um, as we're recovering from all of this? I'm going to take that as a no. The tax code is not relevant to this discussion. I, I don't think um, I would, you know, there were discussions about giving certain, you know, tax credits to businesses, um, you know, more favorable depreciation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. To me, they're just, these are very minor and they're distractions and they're excuses for not doing more. So I think we heard a little bit of that out of the yeah. administration in terms of, you know, oh, well, we're going to give these preferential tax treatment kind of things, tax credits. And I think it's mostly an excuse to not do what actually needs to be done. Okay. Amanda, can um, uh, also want to, uh, Adam had talked to a little bit about what the long-term impact of losing these small businesses, um, particularly minority and women-owned businesses, but in general, what is the long-term impact of the crisis we're seeing in the small business community? I wondered about, um, whether it could be more expensive for companies, just entrepreneurs in the future, whether VC firms might become um, less, more skeptical. What kinds of um, hurdles is this potentially setting up for small businesses going forward? People who wanna start a small business um, in the future. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a long-term trend um, of 40 years of just declining small business dynamism in the United States, and it's kind of moved lockstep with um, economic inequality, which is what my organization, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth Studies, it doesn't necessarily mean it's causation, but there's certainly been a correlation um, between those two phenomena, and it looks like uh, COVID is going to unfortunately be a, an extinction-level event for small businesses absent further um, policy action. So that looks like a lot more consolidation. We saw private equity firms gobble up single family residential real estate after the crisis. The same thing could happen mapped onto the business sector. And, you know, as it relates to um, minority owned small businesses, we also know that uh, black owned businesses were, you know, integral to the civil rights movement of the 60s. They provided power structures um, and institutions and political sway in areas. And when you when you take away that agency um, and, and you know, nodes of political power in areas, I think that there can be long-term impacts on civic engagement um, and, and culture beyond just the economy. Sapton, so, did you have any, um, I know that you mentioned that it could be just harder, the recovery could be harder if small businesses are extinguished. Are there any other long-term effects that you're concerned about? You know, the, uh, I think it's, <clears throat> it is um, one of the features of American, traditional American capitalism that, that people can start their own business and they can get low cost uh, financing. And now, and I know that's unequal, but uh, in many respects, as Amanda pointed out, um, but uh, it has been one of, the, one of the great features that you can start the American dream through a small business. 
Um, but now if that's going to be harder and uh, for businesses or if they feel that there's still continuing uncertainty um, and they're operating under such thin margins as I think we had pointed out before, as Adam pointed out in his own business, that uncertainty um, will kill any invest any idea for people to go and take the risks they need to start a business. Um, and so I think you know that builds up and it, it changes the fabric of communities. Uh, you know I live in I live in Brooklyn and it's and it's far different now than it was six months ago. Um, just as as uh, this is happening all over the country, so it changes the whole identity of how people interact in their communities. Um, and I, I think the next phase to think about is is what happens next. Um, uh, what, who, replace, who replaces these storefronts? How will that change the landscape of, uh, of American towns uh, and cities? Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I have to be honest, I don't know. And I think that's both scary. It, it is also an opportunity for people who are adapting and thinking of innovative new ways to adapt to this new world we're in. Um, but to bring back to a point Amanda said, none of these things will happen until we get the public health situation under control. And there's just not so much uncertainty about opening up your business and then closing it and opening up your business and then closing it. I can be sure that's a good way to, to make things way harder for everybody else. So until we get that situation under control, we can't move to the next stage of trying to help people see the next generation um, to do the things that Adam mentioned about growing the next big business. Adam, what is the next tipping point for you as a small business owner? Um, what is the thing that um, could make the biggest difference for you in the short term? I mean, we need another round of relief. I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the vast majority of businesses, especially in the uh, small business and especially the ones in the hardest hit sectors like leisure and hospitality um, and uh, arts, entertainment, and recreation, they don't think they're going to be recovered in six months. So mm -hmm. we've still got... Um, a lot of struggle left, a lot of time with low demand left. And I think that there's just no getting around the need for more relief. We're, cho we're gonna choose between a huge wave of business failures that generate a slow recovery or more relief. And there's just no, there's no way around it. There's no way around it. I mean, the only thing short of that would be if we had some sort of the virus just disappeared mm -hmm. uh, and that's not gonna happen. So. We sh sure can't bank on it. We don't know what's going to happen. And there's a total asymmetry here in terms of outcomes. You know, you give relief, the virus clears up. What's the damage that's done? You, you maybe help businesses become a little bit more whole compared to the losses that they, they've suffered. Um, you don't give relief and it doesn't clear up. And you've got uh, the recipe for an extremely slow, extremely long recovery that has disparate impacts across groups and across communities. You know, I think a lot of Main Street is an important asset to a lot of downtowns and a lot of places that have been struggling for a long time. It's taken them a long time to sort of rebuild something of these community assets, especially in the heartland in the South. But these are places that lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. And now all of a sudden their small cities have finally, after decades, you know, begun this modest recovery where they become an export sector for these communities because of tourism. And now you're going to wipe out these downtowns. And it's more than just the kind of business that can just go away and come back. That's a community asset. There's really important spillovers. It's the kind of thing that we've seen has taken a long time to build back up as um, medium sized and small sized cities have faced a lot of you know, population loss over time. And to see that wiped out, it's gonna set back places as well. And so that we're gonna see the impact, not just in, in business activity, but in, yeah, the face of a, a small, small, medium, and large uh, cities all over the country. You, we've talked a little bit about um, how PPP um, rules perhaps should be um, uh, streamlined, the, the program should be streamlined, simplified. Would one of the changes that would make a difference, you think, be excluding certain types of companies, like publicly traded companies? There were some publicly traded companies, for example, that got PPP loans. Some of them gave them back. You remember all of those stories where some companies were giving them back. Um, but, you know, we've written about um, companies that were publicly traded and actually gave dividends and did um, stock buybacks, um, even after getting PPP loans. Should the program be restricted to privately owned companies? Uh, I think that's just a massive distraction. I mean, mm -hmm. perhaps, perhaps it should, but I can't tell you from an, uh, how much from an economist's perspective and from a small business owner's perspective, how 
uh, just insane it was in the early days of the PPP program where the rules are convoluted and you don't even want to take the loan because you're worried you're going to end up losing money as a result of the ridiculous rules that were in place. And this media story is focused on how it was too generous to some mm -hmm. companies. What a distraction. What an incredible distraction. I mean, we're talking about going through this mass pandemic, putting a little bit more money in the economy uh, is such a, that, that might be optimal, is such a small, minor, nothing problem compared to the excessive stringency of the rules, the way it tied small businesses' hands. So uh, short answer, maybe. Um, maybe, maybe that makes sense. But the longer answer is we cannot think of that as being anywhere near a first order priority compared to making sure that the money actually goes to the businesses who need it and um, allows them to use it in a way that increases their chances of making it through this. Adam said something earlier, which he said he had to hire an accountant, um, which I think is indicative of the fact that, uh, the PPP imposed a kind of complexity tax on small businesses. And I think that leads to the types of disparities you've seen in the recovery where unless you hired an accountant or a lawyer, uh, you couldn't figure it out and you weren't willing to take the risk. You weren't willing to take the risk of liability. Um, maybe you would have messed up or then you wouldn't take the economic risk because you didn't want to, uh, you weren't sure that a loan would be forgiven. And that just compounds uncertainty. Uh, and uh, uncertainty is the enemy for small businesses, um, for any business. And, um, and so I think, I think that is that complexity tax and the fact that you need to hire an accountant needed and still a PhD in economics still has a difficult time. Uh, and I'm a lawyer and I still have a difficult time understanding exactly how forgiveness works and how it will not work. Um, so, uh, that, that is something I think trying to streamline that. And I understand that these are difficult problems. Uh, these are hard and businesses to my earlier point are uh, heterogeneic, but uh, what we did and where it was rule after rule after guidance after guidance and it kept changing and there was a headline and then we had a new guidance out and then there was like, no, no public companies. Oh, yes, public companies. And it was that compounds the uncertainty that compounds the complexity tax. Uh, and that makes it that much harder for people like Adam who are just trying to make it from point A to point B. Adam, did you just consider the discussion about whether um, the disclosure um, of PPP loans, there was a lot of discussion about whether uh, the companies that rece received them, that should be just public disclosed, how much they received, that sort of thing. Did you find that, I, I get the feeling you found that to be another distraction that, you know, we didn't need to waste our time on. Yeah, it was almost like we shouldn't have done it, but not like for the sake of the businesses, but for the sake of not like, giving the media something to get distracted about. Like, obviously that's not going to be a policymaker's consideration, but maybe they should have because it really just led to a lot of, you know, talking about things that were just of minor importance and focusing on sort of red meat headlines about, oh, look who got this loan, look who got this loan. And it's, you know, it gives them something to get excited about and they're not getting excited about, you know, the actual problems with who's getting the loans. I mean, you could really have made a massive difference in PPP simply by funding it at the proper level and not trying to tie businesses' hands. I don't know how many tens or hundreds of thousands of businesses went out because those two mistakes were made, but that's really where the consequential errors were. It had nothing to do with um, giving it to um, being a little bit too generous with who was allowed to get it. Well, we just have a few minutes left and I wanted to do a final round where I asked you guys to, and I, and I think we've discussed these issues, but if you had a magic wand um, and you could make one change, um, you know, pass one piece of legislation or, you know, get Congress to do one thing that would make a major difference that you feel like in um, saving small businesses, um, what would it be? You want to, you want to start Amanda? Sure. I mean, a couple things. First, we need to get the public health response under control. Um, as for small business, I, you know, if I could have designed the program, I would have covered revenue losses at small businesses um, that experience losses above a certain threshold, um, and then really instituted job sharing programs um, on a nationwide scale. And there's a lot of research that suggests that the countries that had the best economic outcomes, had a good public health response, and had some way to keep workers tied to their job with the um, 
uh, with their revenue supplemented by some uh, UI backstop. So I would have instituted that. And then long term, I think we do need to build better public institutions so that we can do these rescues um, on a more equitable basis. You know, this is twice in 12 years now. The climate crisis is bearing down. That is going to have a lot of risks that we can't even foresee now, and including business risks. So um, I, th I think we need to really invest in, in better infrastructure and rescue systems, both for individuals and for small businesses. Before we go to others, uh, tell me more about this job sharing idea. I don't think I uh, have heard much about that before. Yeah, so some states have it, and it's basically um, instead of laying off workers at a business, um, they can keep all their workers on at half time instead of laying off half their workforce. And then the UI system, the unemployment insurance system, comes in as a backstop and backfills whatever income that the worker is losing by virtue of working half time. So it's, um, it's a good public policy response because it keeps workers tied to their job and it's much quicker and easier to hire them back if they already have some sort of relationship continuing with the employer. And it's, it's found to be win-win in terms of taxpayer dollars and workers and businesses. It's interesting, you mentioned the public infrastructure part of it as well. We've seen with uh, the trouble that so many people have had in getting their unemployment benefits that uh, this, cri this crisis exposed, if nothing else, that, we, that our public infrastructure for these things is, um, uh, is challenged. Satyam, you have your magic, your magic wand. <laughs> magic wand. The, um, I think any solution in the space should help businesses with, these, that, with the debt overhang, with the fixed cost, and, and deal with the complexity tax that, that we talked about earlier. Um, it, specifically in the lane of the small business, but, but I think there's a macro point that I've come to learn over the past few months is that all these debates are, are tied together. Um, and it's easy to stay in our respective lanes as policy people or as advocates in small business or financial or whatever. Um, but the public health, as we discussed, is, is inextricably tied up with the health of small businesses. Even fiscal assistance to state matters for small businesses because otherwise states will be strapped for revenue. That will depress demand and that will uh, cut back on services. And those states will then encourage businesses to maybe open too early because they need the revenues. Uh, and then that will put people at risk and it will compound the public health problem. Um, so all these things feed off each other. And if I had a magic wand, we would, we would solve all of it, of course. But I think this lesson that you can't divorce this debate about small business from the debate about fiscal relief, from the debate about unemployment insurance, from the debate about what to do about uh, the public health response. Adam, I think we're all rooting for your bowling alley um, bar. Um, I hope I get to visit it sometime. Um, and, and what are you gonna do with your magic wand? Um, well, I appreciate everyone rooting for us. Um, can, you, know, you can feel it, that it helps, it matters. Um, you know, our, our team's working very hard. So it's, I think they appreciate you know, that sentiment. Um, so I, I agree with uh, Amanda and Satyam that public health is, this is, this is a public health consequence of a public health problem. And when we talk about sort of long run, what do we do to, to um, help businesses long run avoid these things again, but we don't have another public health crisis. Mm -hmm. And much more so than instituting sort of um, infrastructure to, to be able to do, you know, small business, widespread small business relief over and over again, um, let's institute the infrastructure to prevent pandemics from necessitating that. Um, that would be my long run thing. Short run, uh, I, I support a big zero interest, long amortization, totally flexible loans. I think that that gives business quick, easy, simple cash infusion. They totally understand it, especially when you're talking about zero interest loan businesses, business, you don't even need an amortization table to figure out what your monthly payments are. <laughs> you can take the amount and divide it by 30. That's your annual payments. Like bit, that kind of simplicity, that kind of easy yes for the businesses, because that's what we need it to be. Um, that incentivizes them for long-term, you know, planning to make it through this and not just planning their exit. I think that's absolutely what businesses needs, what the economy needs. We tried, we tried once to do this by tying their hands and it was like, you have this like full court shot, and, you know, once in a lifetime. And what they tried to do was not only make that shot, but make it, you know, blindfolded as well, or a bank shot. Like they tried to do two things at once.
time for that's passed. Help workers through UI and help businesses uh, through uh, this kind of relief. Why is a 0% interest loan better than a grant that can be forgiven or a forgivable loan? So the 0% the interest loan, because it's a loan, you can make it much bigger. That's a big part of this. Like for instead of giving like a little bit of a grant, you can give a big loan because it will be paid back or a lot of it will be paid back. And giving them that a big loan allows them to do this kind of restructuring that makes them much more viable long run. It lowers their operating expenditures. So when okay. you give a grant, you make business viable for uh, as long as that grant lasts. And you give them a one-time cash infusion and you give them no added incentive to figure out a, a long-term plan. When you give them a big loan, you give them a much bigger short-term cash infusion, a much bigger cushion, and you also give them an uh, incentive to stick it out because when they come back, when the economy, when we turn lights back on, their operating expenditures are going to be lower going forward because you restructured them into a healthier, more viable company. And that's needed. We need that sort of medium term, long term thinking and incentive and aid versus a short term. Let's throw cash at the problem until it goes away. Got it. Thank you. Well, thank all of you. And um, I hope uh, we all learned something from this um, and I'll toss it back to Robert. Well, I certainly did. And thank you, Renee, uh, for so expertly moderating that conversation. And thanks to Adam, Amanda, and Satyam for their insights. If, if you heard anything over this panel, and I learned a great deal, it's that the fundamental challenge of this crisis is that the um, health policy issues and the economic issues are intertwined. Um, and in order to solve one, we have to solve the other. And that will be the subject of our last 30 minutes together this afternoon. I'll be interviewing uh, my former colleague, um, Gene Sperling, also a former director of the National Economic Council under Presidents Obama and Clinton, and Andy Slavitt, former acting administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 3 o'clock for our closing conversation with Gene Sperling and Andy Slavitt. See you at 3.